Welcome to the Vertigo Recovery Doctor. I'm Dr. Kevin Smith. I'm a vestibular physical therapist, and today I have Dr. Jason C., who I'm talking with about uh, what the number one factor in your recovery from vertigo uh, may be, and that's sleep. And so I'm very excited to have Dr. C. on. He is a doctor of occupational therapy and trained in cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. Um, we're going to be discussing what the different levels of sleep are, um, how, what, why it's important to sleep, what sleep does for detoxing your body and your brain, um, what happens when you don't sleep, um, and at the end we're going to talk about um, what Dr. C's uh, best tips are to get a great night's sleep. So I'm very excited to have him on, uh, him and I. Uh, we're great friends, and he, both of us are um, very interested in culinary exploration um, and experimentation, and uh, he's a big fan of the outdoors, um, and he's just such a great guy, um, and I'm really excited for you guys, um, for us to have this conversation and to be able to share it with you. Channel. I'm very excited to have Dr. Jason C. on here, who is a doctor of occupational therapy and a sleep specialist. Um, and <clears throat> Dr. C, thank, thank you for coming on. And I just want to, um, you know, get an idea of, of what got you into sleep in the first place and, uh, why you're, why you were so interested in it. Well, first off, Dr. Smith, you could call me Jason. <laughs> uh, thank you for having me on the podcast. It's, it's an honor to be here. As you know, uh, you and I have been working together for a long time and I just appreciate the opportunity uh, for me to be here to help out your clients as well as you helping out mine. So, um, and how I got into sleep was um, we work in outpatient neuro. So a lot of strokes, spinal cord injuries, um, TBIs and things like that um, kind of are the, the, the general population that we would work on. And I noticed a trend that they were having a hard time sleeping. And then uh, my other population that I work on is the oncology population. And so the common theme that I've noticed was that they all had difficulty sleeping. So then during the pandemic, when everything shut down, that gave me the opportunity to like really take a deep dive um, into sleep and what is it and uh, how it affects us. So, you know, I just kind of rabbit hole down that path and here I am now. That's great. Um, what, so what are those, what are the kind of the typical patient that you're seeing, uh, that has, or how would somebody know that they're having to having problems with sleeping? I mean, obviously they're not sleeping well, but what are the symptoms that you would typically expect? Yeah. I mean, like when you know, you know, like people who don't sleep well, they know they don't sleep well and, you know, they come in more fatigued. Um, they don't think clearly, uh, they need X amount of cups of coffee or tea or anything, you know, they're, they're chugging down Red Bull and, and things like that just to, uh, sustain the energy or the mental focus that they need, uh, to do their job. So, um, you'll also see them, uh, their balance is going to be off a little bit. Coordination is going to be off a little bit. And so all those little things that, oh, you know, it's just this, oh, it's just that. No, it could be because you're not sleeping well. Yeah, yeah. And the reason I ask that is because some people are going to be like, oh, you know, I'll, I'll sleep when I'm dead. And they're not really attributing what they're experiencing to sleep problems. Um, but, you know, a lot of, or they're chasing a bunch of supplements, you know, we're always looking at the next wellness supplement, like what's going to fix this problem? What's going to fix that problem? But have you gotten down to those fundamentals of, of like what, you know, sleep, probably the number one thing, right? Um, yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about why? sleep is so important like what's happening when we're sleeping that we need to have that for life right or yeah, definitely wellness so, right you, and you you think about uh sleep in general you know we spend like a third of our time in bed and that's for a reason evolutionary wise we're in bed for a third of the time and so you know when people brag about, oh, I'm getting by with, you know, two hours of sleep, three hours of sleep, like it's a badge of honor. It, it really isn't. It, it's it's a detriment to your body. Yes, you could do it. Yes, you could get by, um, you know, for a couple of days. But if you do that in the long run, it's going to tear you down um, because there's so many things that happen during sleep. Um, so, you know, number one thing right off the bat, 
it's where our body recovers. You know, you're you're beating your body up. Let's say you're a professional athlete and you're you're just training, training, training. And without that sleep, your body's not going to be able to rebuild and fix itself. Uh, cognitively, it's where our brain is cleaning itself out and it's where the consolidation process of memory happens. So, you know, if you're, oh, I can't remember this, I can't remember that, it's because you didn't have that consolidation process in your sleep. And um, you, you think about anyone with Alzheimer's and dementia, you look at them, they don't sleep or they sleep for very short periods of time. So they don't really get into the, um, to the, the deep sleep and the restorative sleep that you need in order for your brain to clean itself out. So you're getting this, you're getting this kind of cleaning process when you're sleeping, um, like all those kind of metabolic byproducts just flushing out. Right. right. Um, and that can kind of, I, I mean, I don't know, I haven't read up on the studies about how, um, that may attribute to any kind of dementia or Alzheimer's, but you know, you get those amyloid plaques, right. And those cognitive diseases and, um, you know, part of the sleep process is kind of clearing those things out. Correct. Correct. So, um, during, during sleep, um, you have this, uh, system called your glyphatic system and the glyphatic system is where it squirts like the cerebral spinal fluid into the brain and things like that. And then it, it pumps, so that it gets all that metabolic waste and the plaque and everything in it and, and it gets rid of it. But if you never get into that deep sleep or you're not in that deep sleep for a long period of time, you don't allow your brain to clean itself out. So that's why you see a lot of people um, have difficulty falling asleep and staying asleep. Yeah. Oh, and, you know, this can attribute to, I think, you know, I... I notice it as everything goes kind of downhill when you're 25 after 25. Right. So yeah, I notice it when I, when I was getting older that how much sleep impacted me, but it's also for when you're younger, you know, you want to, um, you want to optimize your sleep. You're talking about memory, you know, even just students and stuff like that. It was like, you know, let's retain that information when we're in school or, um, set yourself up for wellness later in life. Um, you know, it's, I, I think, I want to get on that end of like, let's prevent stuff, you know, let's start, start sleeping now. Don't wait for when, until it's kind of impacted you later in life, because it, sometimes you get to a point where it's makes it a lot harder to kind of go backwards and, and recover. Yeah. Um, and, 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 you know, like, because we've been in school for so long, we we've, we've, all of us have had those all nighters, right. Where we're studying, mm -hmm. Oh, I got to cram, 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 cram. Yeah. The research shows that you're better off going to sleep getting a good night's rest so that you're actually retaining that information um, so that you can recall it for the test. Yeah. And when you have people with chronic problems, so let's say vestibular migraines, uh, you know, 3PD, um, you know, uh, chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, um, you know, even when you see it in your cancer patients, I'm sure they have a lot of comorbidities that kind of go along with those. Uh, what do you, what are you seeing? Are people having trouble falling asleep? Are they having trouble staying asleep? Are there, is there a difference between the two? Uh, what kind of things are you seeing with those patients? Yeah, so um, yes to all the above. You know, uh, people who have a hard time falling asleep is because their circadian rhythm is off. Uh, people who have a difficult time staying asleep, it's probably because um, it's a it's a behavioral thing that they've been doing that keeps them from falling asleep and staying asleep. So, and then also like with medical issues and things like that, that's always going to play uh, a uh, an issue because even with the oncology population, let's say they have breast cancer and then they're, they're, you know, forced into menopause. Well, they're going to keep waking up because they're getting these hot flashes constantly. Right. Um, or someone who is um, diagnosed with cancer and then, now all you do is you just fear, 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 fear. So then that has, uh, plays a big part into, you know, that stress and everything to fall in, asleep and stay in the sleep because, you know, you got people, uh, men uh, have to wake up constantly because they have an enlarged prostate. And so they're constantly waking up, mm -hmm. going to the bathroom, mm -hmm. going back to sleep, waking up, like all those things. So everybody has a different reason um, to wake up multiple times in the night and everyone has different reasons for not being able to fall asleep. 
uh, when they want to. And so um, that's kind of where there's no one approach that's going to help everybody. You know, it, it's a very individualized um, thing that I do um, to get to the the root cause of what's uh, what the sleep problem is. Uh huh. Are you are you seeing? Um, so you mentioned a couple. You mentioned kind of psychological issues that can kind of affect sleep, right? And then you got those like physiological issues that can affect sleep. So like an enlarged prostate versus kind of more of a psychological like fear. Is there any other categories you kind of place sleep dysfunctions into, or are those kind of like the the biggest ones that that you address, or you know, kind of what are the what are some of those kind of classifications you kind of look at? Uh, to be honest, I, I think like um, everything affects sleep. Everything you do in your life affects sleep, right? So if you don't mind, I'm just kind of go into a little deep dive on, on sleep. And, and yeah. you know, um, so what, what drives sleep pressure, number one, is a buildup of adenosine. So I'm going to kind of geek out here a little bit. Um, and if you want me to simplify things, just let me know. But Adenosine is something that our body um, accumulates through movement in general. Um, so the more you move, the more sleep pressure you have. The less you move, the less sleep pressure you have. And then the higher the sleep pressure, the easier it will be for you to go to sleep. So those that um, have a difficult time uh, falling asleep, it might be because they don't have enough sleep pressure. And why is that? Well, number one, they might not be moving enough. Number two, they might be moving but they might not be, be moving enough and they're napping throughout the day because every time you fall asleep, you use up that adenosine that you've accumulated so that your body never accumulates so much that it's easy for you to fall asleep. So um, that's number one. And then uh, number two, if you're not um, managing your stress or um, your emotions and things like that in a, in a healthy way, your brain's gonna constantly be going over and over and over, which is going to make it really, really hard. So that's like the physical and the psychological uh, things that could uh, make it difficult for you to fall asleep. Um, so let's say you fall asleep. Okay. Uh, so there's, from my knowledge, there's four stages of sleep. So the first is when you're kind of teetering in and out of consciousness. And that can last anywhere between one to 10 minutes. You know, you're kind of like, hmm this like you know um that's stage one stage two now uh things start changing physiologically in our body and that can last up to an hour so this is when your heart rate starts slowing down your breath starts slowing down blood pressure starts going down uh your internal core temperatures starts to to go down a little bit and that is all to get our body ready to get into stage three, which is technically your deep sleep. And this is where all the, the theory is where all the recovery happens, right? Whether your body is fixing itself and your brain is cleaning itself out, um, all the metabolic stuff is getting flushed out and all that stuff. So that's where stage three happens. And so during this time, your brain waves are as if you were dead. It's pretty much non-existent. Um, and we tend to have more deep sleep in the beginning or the first half half of sleep. And then um, it kind of teeters off towards the second half of sleep. And then we get into stage four, which is your REM sleep. So then this is where your brain activity is just as active as if you were um, awake. So um, that's where you're, you're, you're you know, you when you wake up and then you remember that dream, and that's usually because it's in the fourth stage of sleep. And we go through about four to five cycles of this. So you go through one, two, three, four, and then you come, you wake up, and then you just do like four to five cycles a night for a healthy person. And through all this, um, it's normal for people to wake up in the middle of the night, but they shouldn't be um, having a difficult time going back to sleep after it because evolutionary wise, um, nighttime was the only time where we, we as homo sapiens were safe uh, to procreate. So that's why we, we have these cycles. And then once we wake up in those cycles, we go and we, we see if we wanna procreate with our mate. 
if they want to, great, and then go back to sleep. If they don't want to, great, okay, go back to sleep. Um, so that was the only time when it was safe for us to do it evolutionary wise. And so um, I educate people that, you know, it's normal for us to wake up. You know, it's normal for us to be, um, to wake up, to go to the restroom. If you drunk a lot of water right before bed, it's all that stuff is normal. What isn't normal is like when you wake up in the middle of the night and you can't fall back asleep mm. within, I would say like 30 mm. minutes. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Um, and what are you seeing when, when sleep's disrupted um, with, is that leading to um, kind of chronic problems or exacerbating the chronic problems? Like what's the, so is it a chicken and egg thing, you know? <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, that's a that's a great question. Um, there's so much research out there that show um, shift workers, have, you know, they don't sleep at night. They sleep mm -hmm. during the daytime and it's flipped and we are fighting nature at that point. And the research is very strong and saying how it's so detrimental to our health for those shift workers. They have a higher chance of heart attacks strokes um tend to be more overweight obesity um cancer believe it or not too uh more prevalence of cancers from from that um so you know it, it, it's very people who who do those shift work it in my professional opinion shouldn't be doing it for a prolonged period of time i mean you can you can alternate but there's no way for you to be able to live healthy while working at night. Yeah, you're you're going against nature there, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um yeah. Uh so Oh, sorry, Kevin. Oh, um yeah, I also no. want to talk about like, you know, when you are up in the middle of the night, what do we tend to do? We tend to eat, right? And, mm. and that's what leads to the type two diabetes and the obesity and then inflammation. I mean, there's also theory behind it where um, certain microbes are with the circadian clock too, right? So you have certain bacteria in your, in your gut that are awake during the daytime that is meant to digest food. And then when you go to sleep, those bacteria go to sleep as well. So then you have another set of bacteria uh, that are awake at night, but they're not optimized to digest the food so then that can lead to inflammation so so the the sleep's intertwined with your gi tract and how you're digesting and your all that um, and we know the gut you know houses a ton of your immune system and everything huh so yes. okay yeah that's crazy um so the it, okay, so for when you're talking about eating, um, you know, should people be eating right before bed or waiting or don't eat in the middle of the night? It sounds like, right? That's I mean, correct. If they wake up in the middle of the night and they're hungry, um, yeah. I don't know. What would you recommend? So for, that? for me, I always tell my clients to maybe like four hours before bed, stop eating. And that's okay. just being conservative, right? Uh, there are research out there that's showing that um, people who sleep or who eat less than an hour before bed, they have inconsistent sleep times and they have more sleep awakenings at night. Whereas they stop eating more than an hour before bed, they have more consistent sleep and less sleep awakenings at night. So I just like to go the all, you know, all the way over and just like four hours before bed, stop eating. And so... Part of that is because you want to be in a semi-fasted state before your body goes to sleep. Because if you have so much food in your stomach, well, your body's going to be spending a lot of that energy digesting the food instead of getting your body ready to go to sleep. So one of the things uh, in that I was talking about in stage two is like your, your internal core temperature needs to drop a little bit in order for you to fall asleep. But if all that energy is spent in the gut and that's speeding up that, you know, it's working up that metabolism, that's going against what your body needs to do. It's actually increasing your, your core temperature so that you could digest the food rather than bring it down for you to go to sleep. 
Yeah. So that's a tough one. So, you know, my wife and I like, well, you know, you'll have dinner and then kids go to bed and you're like, okay, well, I want some ice cream, you know? And that's probably one of the worst things you could do with the high sugar content and everything like that. Um, <clears throat> I found that, uh, I don't know, that could come down to also like, are you having a well-balanced meal at, at nighttime? Like if you're getting hungry later, you know, um, right. I don't know what you would say about that, but um, yeah, that that's going to be tough for <laughs> For us, especially when you build those habits too, yes. you know, like you, you, you get into the habit of doing that every night. And and so like, I, I tell all my clients too, it's okay if you do it once in a while, but if you do it every single day, then it becomes a problem. Okay. Right? So yeah, yeah. If, if you and your wife are, are just hanging out after the kids are in bed and you know, it's like date night. Great. No problem. Right. Yeah. But if you're doing it every single night and you're you're putting those kind of foods into your stomach, I mean, now we're we're starting to, to d- develop bad habits that could influence sleep. And going back yeah. to diet, um, I'm no dietitian or anything, but I just know in general, if you eat more proteins and you eat more fats in general, you won't be hungry as much. So mm. if you're afraid that, oh, I'm going to be hungry later on, eat more protein, eat more fat. And that will keep you satiated for longer periods. Yeah. Um, and those those habits are hard hard to break. So that's where that kind of physiological and that psychological intertwines too, you know? Because I also know that my wife and I will stay up because, I don't know, I find that when you're, when you're working all day, um, uh, when the kids go to bed, you finally have that free time. And it's like time that you can control, time that you can have your choice of what you want to do over, you know? And so that's hard to give up almost. And so we end up staying up late because we're like, okay, well, we want to do this. We want to watch a show, you know, we want to watch a movie, but then we're sacrificing our time um, because we're kind of, you know, there's, there's that whole psychological thing of trying to um, play it out, look in the future and see, okay, well, if I go to bed earlier, I'm going to have, a better mood the next day. I'm going to have a better, um, I'm going to be more present with my kids. I'm going to be more present with my family. I'm going to be more um, energetic. I'm going to feel better, you know? Um, and so I think at least for me, you know, the, the whole sleep dynamic is difficult with um, kind of that, that psych portion is, is kind of where I fall into it of of developing those habits one and breaking those habits is difficult because you make those connections in the brain that like okay this is what i do this is when i fall asleep and keep training your body and your brain every day at night uh, so it's tough to break and that's where you know like a sleep coach comes in somebody to hold you accountable comes in um right so uh, i don't know that's kind of kind of the struggle of um where i fall into um and and that's that's kind of like that's that's great. I thank you for for that example of you know what you you and your wife do right. Um, it that's how that's your life. So how I would you know go mm-hmm. about helping you with your sleep would be based on all that stuff. It's very individualized. Whereas if I worked with another person, their mm-hmm. whole sleep schedule would be totally different. So mm-hmm. I can't tell them to do the same thing as you do, right? Um, yeah. So that's kind of like where I find the most enjoyment in it because like I actually get to know what do you uh, what do you value the most? You know, what is the most important to you? And then how do we maintain that while still having good sleep? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So um, I'm sure you 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 value your time with your wife and I'm sure you mm-hmm. value your time with your kids. So and I'm sure you value your time to go to sleep. So how do we maximize all three, right? It's, it's For like sure. a healing yeah. act. Yeah. And it's tough. It's tough sometimes, you know? Um, but, you know, that's that's certainly why a lot of people need help with it, you know? Yeah. Um, so what? anything we haven't covered so far that you think is important before we get on to kind of like your top tips for... Um, you know, the, 
the thing that I, I like to tell all my patients too is, you know, our body likes to shortcut everything, right? So that, that's what uh, a routine is. That's what a habit is. It's, it's, you know, you go into the bathroom and you automatically know what to do to brush your teeth, wash your face, all that stuff, because your body has developed that shortcut. So it doesn't have to think about it. But that's technically what you're doing when you go to sleep too. So your body wants to shortcut. So if you shortcut, if your shortcut is, oh, I go to bed and I'm reading, I'm watching TV, um, I'm eating some Doritos, I'm drinking this and, you know, everything except for sleep is happening in the bed. When you get into bed, your body doesn't know what you want to do. So it's going to stay awake because, you know, you go to bed thinking, oh, it's time to go to sleep. But your body's like, oh, it's time to watch TV or, oh, mm. it's time to read a book, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so that's why it's really, really important that when we, um, I tell all my clients, you're only in bed for sex and for sleep. If you're doing anything else, do it outside the bed, because those are the only two associations you, you want your body uh, to have when you're in bed so that it knows it can shortcut right away what, what it needs to do. And how long does it take to break these? If somebody's got a habit, how long, how long do you say like, you need to stick in with this? like trying to make a change for how long before it's going to become kind of automatic? Uh, that's a tough it, It's going to it's depend on the person, right? Yeah. Correct. So. It depends on how <laughs> motivated they are, but on average, it'll take about two to three weeks. Okay. Yeah. So you got to, you got to stick in with it. Kind of just like get into an exercise routine, you know, uh, it, and then once you fall out, like it's hard to get back into it. So, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, so what are your, what are your the top tips for somebody who's having trouble with their sleeping? What's something that they could do now to, to implement for two or three weeks to try and get back on track? So the number one thing I would say is, um, always wake up at the same time is probably the most important thing. So, um, seven days a week, no matter what, you have to wake up at the same time. I would give you, you know, maybe 15 to 30 minutes grace period in between, but you want to be as consistent as possible. Is and So that's number one. Uh, number two, I would say monitor your light exposure 100%. Um, I always say within 30 minutes of waking up, go outside and expose your eyeballs to the sun. Uh, because believe it or not, the sun is what sets our circadian rhythm. So sunrise and sunset is what sets the circadian rhythm. So if you expose your eyeballs to the sunlight, no filter, no glasses or anything, you just let the UV lights hit your eyeballs, that's going to tell your body, it's going to set a cortisol spike and that's the beginning of your um, circadian rhythm. And then if you do a workout on top of that, that's a double spike. So then now you're really telling your body, oh, I should be awake now. And then uh, going for a walk during sunset time um, is going to tell your body that's the end of your circadian clock. And so when the sky starts turning red, yellow, orange colors, uh, when our eye sees that, it's it knows that, oh, it's, it's getting time to go to sleep. So then it's like, all right, start producing melatonin. So then your body starts producing that melatonin over time. But then when you come into the house and you turn on all these bright LED lights that are overhead and so on and so forth, that's going to stop that production of melatonin because now you're telling your body, oh, it's the middle of the day again. Stop producing melatonin. We need to be awake. So the number three thing is, or number two thing was to monitor your lights, making sure at night the, the lights are as soft as possible, dim them as much as you can while being safe so that you can still see what's around and you're not going to trip on anything, but, you know, um, for the older population, you know, who have, uh, visual impairments and things like that, um, just got to make sure everything is clear so that, you know, um, where things are and you, you want to keep the lights down, um, as low as possible. You might want, you, you might want to put like, uh, night lights throughout, uh, the hallways and things like that so that you don't bump into things. Um, but that, that's, super important and then number three exercise you have to exercise so that we're increasing uh the adenosine uh build up so that you're building up sleep pressure and you know exercise is like the best prescription 
for everything. You know, if you if you're hurt, you know, go exercise. If you have a flu, go exercise. Mm -hmm. If you're overweight, go exercise. You know, like the only side effect of that medication is muscle soreness. Mm -hmm. You know, and that will last for you know a day or two, but then it will get better. And you know, and there's all these health benefits to exercise. So um, if you don't know where to go to start exercising, I mean, just get a personal trainer or go on YouTube, look for any kind of like, you know, beginner's exercise program or beginner's exercise class or whatever, um, whether it's um, cardio exercise or resistance training, it doesn't matter. Like, Just go out and move is, is, going to be so important and i would say the last thing is to keep a consistent sleep schedule as close to it as possible sleep at the same time wake up at the same time over and over and over again and try not to deviate and you know it's not whether you fall off everyone's going to fall off the you know and 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 stay up way past when they're they're not supposed to and or they'll sleep in because they're like oh this just feels so nice that's fine. Those one-offs are, are fine. Just don't make it consistent. More often than not, be consistent with your sleep. And those are like my four main uh, tips that I like to give to all my patients. Yeah. And I, um, for the, specifically for the vertigo population, you know, if somebody has vertigo, um, you, you're getting, especially if you're getting dizziness with laying down and rolling over, there's a high chance that you, and it's lasting less than a minute. There's a high chance you have BPPV and that's a quick fix. You know, they go see a vestibular specialist, have it repositioned, get rid of that. Cause that's going to help you not wake up in the middle of the night. Cause you're dizzy. Um, for that more chronic vertigo population, you got to start with these fundamentals of sleep to give you the foundation to recover from whatever chronic, whether it's, vestibular migraines or 3PD or, you know, cervicogenic dizziness um, or any other chronic issue that we talked about, like the the chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, um, chronic pain, um, you know, or even if you're in some kind of like cancer um, rehab or something like that, um, got to have that sleep as that found foundation. Um, and, and you, you know, all those things that you talk about, like what's the common factor, they're all inflammation of some sort, right? Mm -hmm. The, the, the yeah. bottom line is it's inflammation. So your body needs to get rid of that inflammation, right? And you, your body will do that through sleep, but you have to get into that deep sleep so that your body can help clean itself out figure out what it needs and what it doesn't need and, and so on and so forth. Right. And making sure you're, you're eating right. So, so making sure, you know, um, you're not eating anything that can keep uh, causing the inflammation from going on. And then exercise is going to help with inflammation. It might cause a little inflammation in the beginning if you're new to it, but ultimately exercise is going to increase circulation in your body, which it provides blood flow and then blood flow helps to clean and fix and all that stuff. So Excellent. All right. So, um, Jason, how can people, if they want to work with you, if they're having trouble with their sleeping, they need somebody to help coach them through how to get better sleep so they can help recover or just, just feel good, you know, have wellness, um, in their life. How can they get a hold of you? How can they work with you? Um, what's the oh. best way? So I have a website. It's called proactive dash ot.com. Um, and there's all this information on how you can get a hold of me, or you could email me directly at J A S O N T S E O T D at gmail.com. Um, and then, you know, we, we could be in contact on, on how we can set something up too. Perfect. I'll put that those in the show notes below. Uh, awesome. but thanks so much for coming on and thank you for all your, your wisdom and insight into sleep and, uh, how somebody can kind of get better, you know? Uh, I yeah. just want people to have hope that there's something they can do to make their situation better. So thanks, Jason. Chris, Definitely. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm.